Who am I? So I moved, I'm a four-time entrepreneur. Uh, I like to say that I've never had a real job. Um, this job is way harder than a real job. Uh, so for all of you who are CEOs in this room, I'm sorry. Um, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Uh, I like to say that uh, being a CEO is sort of like being with Mike Tyson in a dark alley. And on one hand, he has an ice cream cone. On the other hand, he has his right. And you never know which one's going to hit you in the mouth in any given moment. Um, the swings that you guys go through is amazing. And I have so much respect for what you're doing. I'm glad I don't have to do it anymore. I like to say that I'm a washed up entrepreneur now and I've washed up on the beach that is investing and I look at all of you out there in the storm and I have so much respect for you. Um, so thank you, uh, all of you for doing what you do because without you, we wouldn't have a job and um, I wouldn't be able to get up here and pretend like I know anything and uh, you are making the world a better place. So um, uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'll stand over here so you can all see the screen. Uh, so four time entrepreneur, um, like Haas said, I started my last company in 2005. It was an ad tech company. We went through eight pivots uh, over 10 years. Um, so clearly I was really, really good at my job. Uh, no, not so much. It took me a long time to learn a lot of things. And those early years were, were a lot of uh, me running into walls, taking too long to realize I was being stupid, and then repeating the process. Um, but we found at the end, we sort of found our sweet spot and grew it up to about 30 million in revenue and about 60 employees and then eventually sold it off. So I got to enjoy the hard parts of being a shitty CEO and then the good parts of feeling the scaling that is the rocket ship ride of an awesome company. And I'll talk about why I think that's probably the most important part of any company uh, when I get to that part of the, the talk. Um, and then I switched over to investing. Um, Got lucky, one of my first investments sold for a billion dollars six months after I made it, so suddenly everyone thinks I know what I'm doing. I don't, um, but the cool thing is that I am an entrepreneur, and I'm now in the dark side, and I get to see the other side of the table, and I get to see all the things that happen in venture capital, and I get to be part of those investing decisions, and I can share with you what I see. And so my goal today is not to like teach you the one-on-ones about how to raise money by making a deck and how to get investor introductions and a whole bunch of other things. I'll talk about some of those things, but really what I would rather do is I'd rather share my perspective as an entrepreneur in looking at the investment process now that I'm on the other side. Um, and I'm gonna try to do it by telling as many stories and trying to be as entertaining as possible because these things tend to be a little dry and I don't want to waste everyone's time. So I apologize if you came here looking for 101 investing fundraising. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm rather going to try to share what I've learned in this process and, and what's, um, uh, what's going on uh, in the venture community today. Um, like Haas said, um, I now invest uh, early stage generally, though I write checks up to $10 million. Um, we look for, gen I, I generally enter, invest in enterprise companies, though I look at consumer stuff, enterprise is my sweet spot. Uh, about 33 companies so far in the last three years, so I'm pretty prolific. Um, and I love weird stuff. So the weirder the company is, the more exciting it is to me. I like overseas stuff, so I know we have a bunch of entrepreneurs here from, uh, from Denmark, which is pretty cool. So maybe I can invest in all your companies. Um, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at. So um, let's talk about the most important thing today. Your baby, the company that is, you're working on, I, I think we all know like, how brutal it is to have to go out and try to raise money for your baby. Like, it's, it's excruciating to like, talk to some idiot like me who doesn't understand what you're doing and try to communicate with that person sort of why this baby is going to turn into the next great Michael Jordan or name your famous uh, uh, um, Curie or... Einstein or whoever, it's, it's an incredibly hard process. Um, and I think, I think one of the things that's really important, and I think one of the most important things you always need to remember in the investment process, and I think the most important thing about early stage fundraising as well, is that your baby here, who you know, you know better than anyone else. You know, the, you know the ins and outs, you know how she cries, you know how she laughs, you know how she stumbles when she starts to walk. You know all the wonderful things about her. But like, when you try to sit down and raise money from somebody, they know nothing. All they see is a weird looking face. And they're like, they're trying, they're trying to imagine how this, this baby, is going to turn into a multi-billion dollar company. And what a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of, in the fundraising process, one of the biggest failures I've seen over and over again, and I think it's one of the most important lessons that I've learned, and I certainly failed at this when I was an entrepreneur, is that that matching process 
between you, the entrepreneur, and the investor who's going to invest in your company is, is as much of an art as it is a science. And it's an art of imagination. And so like, for you, the entrepreneur, trying to communicate what you're doing and where you're going and what you're going to do, the, entrepreneur, the investor on the other side of the equation, we all come to it with our preconceived notions, our belief of how the world works, our sense of, oh, I love GovTech, but I hate ad tech, and maybe I'll invest in ed tech. Like, we all have these weird things about what we've learned as a course of our investment journey. And it's so hard to make a match as an investor sitting on the other side of the table between what you believe about your baby and what I believe about your baby, that you as entrepreneurs always need to remember that when the investor basically says no, and the investor basically doesn't like it, or it says your baby is ugly, it doesn't mean that the baby is ugly. It doesn't mean that the baby isn't going to turn out to be something wonderful. But what it does mean is that at the end of the day, there's a cognitive mismatch between all the shit that is in my brain and all the shit that's in your brain. And it's a very difficult process to bridge that gap. And so the most important lesson that I would tell you, at, you know, at, at one point in my career, I did 100 pitches over the course of a one-year period um, trying to get a VC to give me money. And the most important lesson is just, just keep talking to investors. Like at the end of the day, when an investor says no, when an investor gives you feedback you don't like to hear, that doesn't mean your baby's ugly. It doesn't mean your company's not going to grow up to be amazing. The best companies in the world almost always get a ton of no's. It's OK. It's a really hard process, that matching process. So feel comfortable and don't feel, don't feel demotivated when an investor says no when, you're talking about your, when they're talking about your baby. Um, I'll tell you a little story about that, that year for me. Um, so we, 2008, I don't know how many pivots in we were in, you know, probably like five or six pivots. Um, we had raised, uh, we'd raised about a million bucks from a bunch of great investors, and then Lehman crashed. And suddenly, basically, the world just went, Bone dead. I mean, literally, you couldn't raise money if you tried. It was the hardest. It, nobody could raise money. They, uh, Sequoia famously put out this tombstones deck, and it was like, everybody put your head down, be really scared. Um, so we had just raised money, but we realized that our previous business model was not going to go anywhere, and we were in a lot of trouble. Um, and so we found this new business model, which was um, it's called real-time bidding. So those of you who don't know real-time bidding, real-time bidding is the sort of, now it's the underlying technology for almost all advertising on the web. But um, in 2008, it was just brand new. It was just a crazy idea. And 20 million ad impressions a day were transacted via RTB. Now it's 200 billion. But just to give you a sense, it was, it was nothing. And so we saw that and we said, OK, let's bet on RTB. Like, this is the future. Let's do it. Um, if it takes off, we win. If we don't, who knows? We're dead anyway. Lehman's crash. The world's going to end. Like, let's bet on this thing. Um, company at this point was probably like six people. Um, so we bet on RTB, and it was amazing. It was at 20 million impressions a day, and then it just it was scaling at literally 100% a month. I mean, it was just like just going so fast. And uh, a couple years later, that million bucks we had raised had run out, um, and we were running out of cash. And our note came due, um, so we had raised in total basically we, the, the million was on a note, so we had about two million dollars we'd raised on a note. Our note was coming due on April 1st, so. You know, about midsummer the year before, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start fundraising. I'm gonna give myself plenty of time. You know, I'm gonna be fine. Um, we're doing RTB. RTB has gone at that point from 20 million impressions a day to billions of impressions a day. I mean, like, and our, we had revenues and we had great customers and like the business was like was crushing it. And uh, so I went to my first VC pitch meeting, and they're like, yeah, not so much. And then I went to my next VC pitch meeting, and they said, yeah, not so much. And so this, this went on, September, October, November, December. December, oh, we've got a VC who wants to give us money. Um, January comes, ah, uh, yeah, no, we don't want to do it anymore. So April 1st was when we ran out of cash. We, knew, we owed $2 million on April 1st. Or no, we owed $2 million to all of our note holders. We had no more cash. Uh, a week before, uh, we were down to $5,000 in the bank. And we owed Google a quarter million dollars on April 1st. So we, we timed it right. We timed it that we would run out of cash right when our notes came due, uh, and we would be dead all in unison, which was you know, perfect death timing, I guess. Um, so we were dead, dead in the water. So um, this venture capitalist from New York calls me up. He's like, Zach, uh, I just heard about your company. Uh, come to New York and come talk to me. And I was like, oh, we're fucked, but maybe. So I, I go look at the flights in New York. Flights were like 
1500 bucks because he wanted me to be there the next day. Economy, $1,500. It's crazy. They screwed me. But I, so I went to my sister, who is my co-founder. I was like, Sue, we got $5,000 in the bank, and it's going to cost me $1,500 to fly to New York to see this guy. She's like, we're dead anyway. Just go do it. So I, I get on a plane. I fly to New York. I meet a guy's name Santo. I meet Santo. And Santo's like, I like it. Come meet my partners on Monday. We were out of money on Tuesday. And I was like, <laughs> and they're in Boston. Another expensive plane flight. So, so I go to, I fly to, um, fly to Boston. Um, it's like the worst flight of my life. There's like a nor'easter coming in. I mean, just like the gods were clearly just messing with my head. Fly to Boston, um, terrible flight, scared the shit out of me. You know, you know when you're landing the plane and it's like doing all that crazy stuff and you land and the flight attendant says, okay, you can clap now. Like, you know that that was a bad flight. <laughs> um, so, so I'm, and, I'm, I'm, I'm a little stressed. The next morning, I'm a little stressed out. My insiders, my note holders, so I had, um, I'll talk about bad investors later in this deck, but I had a couple bad investors. I had a couple amazing investors, but a couple bad investors. And so, you know, I was on the phone with them before my meeting, and they're yelling at me, you better get this done, blah, 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 going crazy. Like, I mean, just really brutal. Like, you know, you're, you're a fuck up. Like, you know, really rough. Um, and uh, so I go to the partners meeting, and uh, we have the partners meeting, and uh, I've done 100 of these in the last year. And I'm out of money the next day. So I do the best I can, but I'm dead. Um, get done the partner meeting, leave the partner's meeting, and uh, the, 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 the partner comes out. He's like, we're going to give you a term sheet. Holy shit. Like, talk about the save of a lifetime, right? Um, and he says, uh, yeah, we're going to give you a four on a four. Uh, so he's going to give us $4 million on a $4 million valuation. Plus, we had raised $2 million before. So that was really a $6 million investment on a $4 million valuation, which would functionally leave 60% of the company in the hands of the investors and a little bit left for us. And this was for the Series A. So you can imagine if we were going to raise a Series B and a Series C later on, I would eventually own 0.000% of the company. Like, so it was a total screw job. Like, it was like, going to totally rip us off. Um, and I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, so, uh, but then I was like, but Santo, we run out of money tomorrow, uh, and I need money. So can you give me a half million dollar loan uh, to pay Google? Otherwise, we go out of business. And he was like, oh, yeah, sure. I don't know why he did that, but he did. Um, and then we were lucky enough to go renegotiate. That We had this crazy renegotiation period over the next month where we eventually told him, oh, we, we don't want your money, we're, even though we were dead. We don't want your money. We're going to go find somebody else to give us money. Uh, but he eventually renegotiated to relatively reasonable terms. Um, and so... The lesson is, is it ain't over till it's over. And like for all of you who are out raising money, talking about your babies, it, it, you, you can still get it done. Um, and uh, it, it can happen. So let me talk today about, um, I'm going to talk about the different things that investors look for. Um, I don't know if you guys know who this is, but it, one of the greatest soccer players in all time. Uh, he's, I mean, he literally, he, he seems to score at will. Um, there's three things that investors look for that are, that are great. Um, this is somebody who's already sold a company for a billion dollars. So none of you have done that because you wouldn't be here if you had. Um, but investors will give those guys money like you wouldn't believe. Like, it's just, forget about it. You're not that person. But like, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the professional investment money that goes into companies um, goes into companies that are run by people who've already successfully sold companies for huge amounts of money. And it's important to recognize that for those of you who are not that person, um, you're going to have to operate by a different set of rules. And it's not the stuff you read about on TechCrunch in a lot of cases where it's like XYZ VC firm gave a $5 million term sheet to a company that was just an idea. It's literally, it's a different set of rules, which I'm going to talk about today. But a lot of the investments that go out there, a lot of the real money that moves is going into people who've already built and sold companies for a large amount of money. And I think it's, it's, it's important to recognize that when you're not that type of person, you're going to have to operate by a different set of rules. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I'm not saying this is the way y'all are. Um, but I think you need to recognize, and I think it's very important when you're raising money. And it's something that I've learned the hard way, both with my companies and now with the companies that I invest in, is that every single company, whether it's eBay, PayPal, Facebook, they all start like this. They all literally start with a shitty product and a shitty team and a shitty approach. And everything is generally, at the beginning, really, really bad. But the thing that really matters is not about where you start. It's about basically progress. And so in a lot of cases, like 
if you think of, we want to use the soccer metaphor here, if these kids were playing on the professional pitch, they would never succeed. But when they play on a pitch here, they have a chance of succeeding. They have a chance of getting somewhere. And so for all of your companies, at the earliest stage of your companies, one thing that I see entrepreneurs make the mistake at over and over and over and over and over again is that they have a grand idea and they try to go play on the professional fit pitch on day one. And I would rather recommend to all of you that the most important thing you can do is demonstrate initial traction with your business. And the best way to do that is to go play on a niche, in a niche, to play on a pitch, to play in a space where you have a chance of winning early on and demonstrating that you're going to get it done. And like invest as, as an investor, I love to see a business and I love to see entrepreneurs who, who basically have a big vision of the world and they're, 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 they're self-aware enough to then zero it down into a niche and a problem set that they can actually accomplish and show traction, show customers, show movement in their business rather than basically focusing on boiling the ocean on day one. Um, so my recommendation to everyone is basically in this process of when you're working on building your business and when you go out to fundraise, Try to build that traction by going and playing in fields that you have a chance of winning at, where you can basically you can compete against the other competitors that you're competing with, and rather than basically trying to go boil the ocean with a big idea, because I think it's it's it becomes incredibly easy to see entrepreneurs who can move the ball forward, and the only way to do that is to play in areas and niches and and places where you can actually get things done. And all companies, every company, basically when it starts starts at the bottom, and they slowly build their way up. Um, and so, as an investor, I, it's just over and over and over again. Um, like, this process of starting to slowly learn to walk, and then to run, and then to like take off is, is like, is critical. And so, I would highly recommend to all of you in the fundraising process, if you can't show a graph and a story of your demonstrable process of progress and traction as you build your business and learn to walk, like you're really going to struggle in your fundraising process. And I think, I think one of the, the secrets that I've learned in the, in the investment business is most of us on the other side of the equation, we don't actually know shit about the core important hard things about your business. We don't know how the code works. We usually don't know how the hard tech works. We rarely know about like what it is you're actually doing. But if you show them in a graph that goes like this, you get really excited. You're like, hey, look at that. Look at the graph go. And then you can just bet on the stupid graph. And most of these investors out here, that's all they do. They just look at the graph and they bet on the graph. And so just focus on the graph from day one and slowly build it, and you're going to find that your fundraising process is phenomenally easier. Um, one of the other things, and I think one of the hardest things to raise money for, is raw tech. Um, I think a lot of people out here, technologists in particular, believe that a lot of companies are, are they're all about raw tech. Um, and in my experience, having looked at a lot of investments that are raw tech and then watched a lot of um, company rounds that are raw tech, I think it's one of the hardest things to do. And so what I mean by raw tech is let's say you invent a new type of telephone, an amazing, amazing technology, um, and you're like, oh my god, this, this technology is going to change the world. I'm going to go raise this money, raise money against this. Uh, it's going to be really easy. Um, I think I would recommend to all of you that that's a struggle. It's very difficult. And a lot of entrepreneurs think it's, that's the secret. I would always say to you, if you have raw tech, the most important thing to do is figure out how to go back to that principle I just gave you before. How do you validate that raw tech and show that it works? Show that it has lift. So today I, I met with an entrepreneur, who uh, smart entrepreneur, super smart. Um, he's got a new cryptocurrency hedge fund. Um, and uh, he, uh, he, he recruited some of the best uh, engineers out of uh, you know, uh, an algorithmic trading firm in Wall Street. And he's, you know, he's got raw tech up the yin yang about how he's going to basically trade crypto. And, and I was like, so what are the results? And he was like, well, we're going to need a lot of money to go prove the results out. And like, no, never. Never. Don't do that to yourselves. If you have raw tech, have results. Figure out a way to get to results so that you can prove that your raw tech works. I think every single, no investor has the time to diligence a brand new idea with raw tech in it that they like it's just really really difficult to do but every investor can get really excited and start to basically do diligence and start to dig into your idea if you can show the advantage that you have the way that it works and the way that it's actually in progress so i highly recommend in the process of going out when you're trying to raise money um, 
and you have raw tech, um, try to figure out how to get there. Um, so I, I think one thing that we should, we should also talk about is friends and family. So um, this is really hard because you're probably all going to raise your friends and family's money. And given the statistics that normally happen in this business, you're probably also going to lose your friends and family's money. Um, I've lost a lot of my friends and family's money. Um, and it's pretty painful. Um, so I, I have a couple things I'd say. One, if your friends and family are not investing in your company, most professional investors probably won't want to invest either. Because if I look at a round that's coming together, and it doesn't have friends and family money in it in some way, shape, or form, I ask, why? Even if your friends and family don't have much money, if they don't believe in you enough to invest in your business, if they don't believe in you because they know you better than anyone else in the world, if they don't believe in you, how, how am I supposed to believe in you? Um, and, so, and if you think about the fundraising process, I think one of the most important lessons is that in the same way that a business basically can get traction over time, um, your fundraising process is also about getting traction over time. And that first step in any fundraising process, the easiest money you're going to raise is from the people who know you and trust you and love you. And so even if it's only a few thousand dollars, there needs to be on that fundraising cap table for an investor, there needs to be friends and family money that's on there. Because if, it does, if it's not on there, it's a giant red flag. Um, it's the first step in the process. You can't go anywhere else. If you can't raise that money, like you literally probably shouldn't even try to raise any money whatsoever. Um, so like that's where you start. And I'll get into the next step in a second. Um, but, but the most important thing you can do with your friends and family is you absolutely cannot, cannot, cannot tell them all the crazy dreams you have in your head without at the same time telling them there's a 100% chance you're going to lose all of this. Don't give me any money you're not prepared to lose because you probably are all going to lose all that money. And the relationships that you have, your friends and family, are incredibly important to you, and they're worth more than your company. And like, don't kill your friends and family's relationship over the money you raise from them. No matter how important you think it is, don't do it. I've seen it happen. It's terrible. Like, and the problem that we entrepreneurs have is that we all live in this like world of our delusional, like, like myopic. I don't know what we want to call it. Hypnosis. Like, we all do. The only way that you can be a successful entrepreneur is you have to basically delude yourself in believing that it's a good idea because um, generally it's not. Um, but don't do that to your friends and family. So please do yourself a favor. Um, please tell them that, uh, that you're going to lose all that money. But you also have to raise that money if you're going to be able to succeed. So that's one of the first hard tests of entrepreneurship is figuring out how to tell them you're going to lose all their money and still getting them to give it to you. Um, but it's the secret. You have to get it done. Um, so basically, first step in fundraising, raise friends and family. If you don't raise friends and family, don't even bother doing it. If you can't, if you can't with a straight face, go to your friends and family and ask them for money, you, you're not going to be able to succeed anywhere else. Like, you have to be able to ask those people. So first step is to raise your friends and family money. Um, so then, now we get to the second part of the process. Um, so now you've gone out and you've raised your, and it really doesn't matter what size amount of money you're raising. Like you could be raising, um, uh, you could be raising, you know, fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, or twenty million dollars. Um, this all these lessons kind of apply. So you're you've gone out, you're fundraising, and you've got friends and family who are coming in. Um, uh, now you've got friends and family. The next step in the process, um, and I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, I think don't do as good a job with this as is important to be done, is that you want to raise smart money. And now everyone says smart money, and they're like, oh, smart money is great, blah, blah, blah. What I mean by smart money is money that's actually smart about what it is that you're doing. So for instance, if you come to me and you basically tell me, hey, Zach, I have this new great consumer dating app, I don't know shit about that. And I'm not smart about your problem, and I'm not going to be able to understand a problem at the very beginning, like the earliest stage of a company where most of you are. I'm not going to be able to understand that because I'm not smart about your particular problem. Now, if you come to me and say, Zach, I got this great ad tech idea. Like, I know a lot about ad tech. I think 90% of the ideas are terrible. I'll probably think your idea is terrible. But like, it's still, I'm, I can be smart in your particular problem. 
So the next set of investors that you go to after you've gone to friends and family, this is critically important, you need to go to people who are experts on the problem that you're working on solving. And so I'll give you a little great fundraising hack here. Actually, I'll give you two great fundraising hacks. Hack number one, professors who are experts about your problem generally don't have a lot of cash, but they generally do have great names and they tend to be experts on a particular problem. And so what you can do is you can email investors email professors or academics or people who basically are experts but who are not rich and say to them, hey guys, I'm doing this company, it's in your space, I'd love to pitch you on the idea and if you're interested, I'd love to basically bring you on as an investor and an advisor. So the great thing you can do there is basically you can get a person to invest, which means they're putting skin in the game, which means they actually do believe it's a good idea. If you just make them an advisor, they'll be like, oh sure, give me free stock, I'll take it all day long. But if you make them invest and be an advisor, they have to put some skin in the game, and then you can use the advisor shares to boost their ownership to a level where they actually feel like it's a good deal. So let's say I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota, and I do agriculture technology, and you call me up, and you're like, hey, hey Zach, uh, uh, I got this idea, I'd love you to invest and advise, and I, uh, uh, I'm doing this ad tech idea, ad, 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 agriculture uh, tech idea. Um, you know, if I invest $5,000, it's probably not going to be like, it's hard for me as a professor to invest $5,000 in a little baby startup that I ever see. But if I invest $5,000 and I get, you know, a quarter percent of equity to be an advisor, suddenly now you as the entrepreneur, you just achieved three things. One, you got a little bit more money, which is great, that's good. Two, you now have an expert who has skin in the game and who cares about your company. So they can help you in this process, they can introduce you to people, they can tell you when you're being stupid, they can make your investment look like you, you're more successful because now you have friends and family and you've got these smart professors from the middle of nowhere that you didn't know before but who signed up because they think your idea is really good. And more importantly, basically they can act as a sounding board throughout the rest of the life of your company, which at the end of the day, go back to all of us entrepreneurs being myopic and in the middle of our you know, drug-fueled hallucinations that is a startup, it's critical to always have people who basically can talk to you and tell you the truth. And um, advisors can perform a very important role there. Um, so uh, that's probably one of the best sort of smart money hacks that I've ever come across is like getting those really smart people on board um, who, who really know your space well. Now you can go all the way through to professional investors and like find people who are professional investors in your um, in your sector, um, but do the research and figure out who the people are who actually know your stuff. Too many, too many startups I talk to are like, oh yeah, I went to Greylock and Greylock hated my idea. And I was like, which partner did you go to? And they're like, oh, I went to James. I was like, well, well James does this and you're doing that. Why did you talk to him? Like, you, you need to do your research and really understand who it is that you're going to pitch and make sure in the early stage of your fundraising, you only pitch people who understand your space. Otherwise, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, if they don't know you and they don't know your space, there's almost no chance that they're going to invest in your company. Um, it's, uh, it'll go a long way. Uh, the second hack I'll give you is um, it's the, uh, the update hack. So um, everyone asks me, well, how do I meet investors? And, uh, and cold emailing investors is like the worst idea ever. Like, you know, I get 50 cold emails a week and they're begging for money and it's just bad, right? Like how do I parse through those? How do I sort through that? How do I understand how to even think about these ideas I've never met the co-founders, the founders for? But I love to learn about new markets and I love to learn about new entrepreneurs and new businesses. So if you want to meet an investor, let's say you identify a really smart investor who works at a VC firm or an independent investor and you're like, this guy's gal is really smart. I want to work with this person. You know, if you cold email them asking for money, it probably won't work. You can get an introduction from a, a, a friend of theirs. That's the best way to do it. But another way you can do it is you can send them an update email about your company on a relatively regular cadence, maybe once a quarter, once every few months, and say, hey, Zach, here's what we did. Here's, what, here's the progress we've made. Here's where we're going. Just want to let you know. And oh, by the way, here's some cool insight about my market. Here's something that nobody else knows about the market that I'm playing in. Here's some knowledge and information. And so now me as an investor in those scenarios, you just gave me a gift. You gave me the gift of knowledge about you, because I get to track you over time. You gave me the gift of knowledge about the traction of your company, so I can see as it improves over time. And you gave me the gift of knowledge about your market, the place that you play in that you know better than anyone else. And so suddenly, instead of it being you asking me for money and trying to take my time, you instead are giving me, the entrepreneur, a gift 
And there's this great insight into cognitive psychology, which is that like when you give people gifts, they suddenly feel like they have an obligation to you. And so if you give someone a gift quarter over quarter, pretty soon you find out when you go fundraising in a year and you go and meet that person, they're your best friend. They're like, oh my God, thanks for coming in. Thanks for all those great emails. Like you have been helpful in that process of updating the person, even though you're actually trying to get them to give you money, but you just shifted from a give me, give me to a here, I'm gonna give you a little bit. And suddenly you built that relationship. And so um, with smart money, it's, it, these things can take time, but I highly recommend um, uh, trying to get the smartest money you can get. Um, so let's, let's talk about the idea. Um, so, by the way, I, I, hope, I hope my format works. And I hope in the NPS that we do afterwards, if you think this format sucks, please tell me. Um, I, I, I like, the harder the feedback is, the better. Um, so if you think it really sucks, you can use a lot of swear words. Um, but I, 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 don't, I like to keep these talks try to, as organic as possible, and it, it, I find it better to like kind of jump around than to sort of have this sort of, you know, work, let's just work through the spreadsheet and the, uh, the outline. Um, but please tell me if this sucks. Um, the idea. So um, every great entrepreneur has a great idea. Your idea is worthless. Like, it doesn't mean shit. Like, don't think it does. There's so many ideas out there. They're all so amazing. It doesn't mean anything. But if you have a validated idea, it's super duper awesome. So what's the difference? An idea is an idea. A validated idea is an idea that you've proved. And what I mean by that is if you go read Steve Blank, he has this great book, Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, uh, Eric Reese with Lean Startups is doing some really cool stuff around customer development. Um, there's a lot of good knowledge out there about the process of idea validation. But the most important thing you can do with your idea is you can prove that it actually works. And so um, uh, let, me give you, let me give you an example of that. So Ha today we were at dinner, she was telling me that she just heard a pitch about um, a company that basically is um, uh, doing camper vans. Right? They're, they're, they're making camper vans. Great. Great. No, that's perfect. That's perfect then. And Ha said that, was, that sounded really cool. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, the first question I have is, prove it. Prove it to me that that business is super exciting and it's game changing. And show me, and it doesn't mean that you have to launch the business and like sell a bunch of camper vans or do what you have to do. But I need data that demonstrates that that idea is actually a really good idea. And show me the traction that that's starting to get. And then suddenly, a cool idea with traction um, can, be, can be really, really interesting. So for instance, I'll give you an example of a company that I invested in. I shouldn't, I shouldn't yeah, I'll use this one. Um, um, so there's a, I invested in a company called Entropy. Um, worst name ever. The youth is a terrible name. You see this on the video. Um, but it's an amazing technology. So the youth uses, they use computer vision to basically you can take a little electronic microscope that attaches to a cell phone and you can stick it on a, a physical object and tell if it's real or not. It detects counterfeit physical goods. Using computer vision and electronic microscopy, you can, because of the microscopic level, it's very difficult to counterfeit anything. Um, so they can look at a Gucci handbag, $10,000 Gucci handbag, and be like, this is real or not real. Amazing idea, right? Like, really, really cool. Like, a trillion dollars a year goes through counterfeiting, and if you could do it via, via computer vision, uh, uh, you'll, you'll change the world. But, like, it's a crazy idea. How would that ever work? I mean, you have, like, unbelievable number of, like, objects that you have to get into your database. But the thing that Vidyut did, which was really smart, is he basically built a prototype of this device, and he started with one set of handbags, he started with one set of Louis Vuitton handbags, and then he went to pawn shops in the middle of the country, and got who were actually buying and selling these on eBay, and he got Susie's Pawn Shop in Kankakee, Illinois, to use his device to buy and sell a very small number of Louis Vuitton handbags. And so suddenly, he basically took this giant market and narrowed it down to this very small, single customer in the middle of the country, and proved that it actually worked at this very small scale for this very particular set of handbags. And so for the, for the first year, he was in pawn shops with this little device. This is an NYU PhD, you know, really, really smart like engineer. And he's hanging out in a pawn shop, scanning these physical handbags to figure out if they're real or not. But he proved that his technology worked. 
and was able to basically then expand the company, and now it's well on its way to being a multi-billion dollar company. I hope so anyway, we'll see. It, but it's well on its way to being a very valuable company. Um, and so by, by taking a big idea and figuring out how to narrow it down and validate it, as an investor, I can look at that idea and suddenly get really excited about it. So when you're in your pitch, when you have your deck, when you're talking to an, an investor, idea, validation. There should, everything you say throughout your pitch Whenever you talk about something, it needs to be validated and proved, even if it's only in the pawn shop level at the smallest scale, every single one should have that. Um, super duper important. And as with that, traction. Like, it's a, it's a buzzword that's repeated over and over again, but as I kind of said at the beginning of this conversation, not really conversation, talk, um, if, if you don't have traction, you're, you're what do you have? Like, you should be able to demonstrate day over day improvement. Every part of your business, not everything doesn't always go up. I, I like to say that the hard part about this job is that it's a rocket ship ride into the wall of our own incompetence. Like, we start off and we're like, woohoo, and blast off and we hit the wall and smear across it and we try to get ourselves put together and then we go again. So no one's graph is gonna go like this. All of our graphs will kind of go like this as we hit a very set of wall. It's funny, you look at like Elon Musk, right? One of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time. And um, I mean, he almost drove Tesla and SpaceX out of business at the same time. Like, I mean, how, how, that's amazing, right? Multi-billion dollar successful entrepreneur and he literally hit his own walls of incompetence at the same time, like massively. I mean, I think if, even if Jeff Bezos started a new company today, he would, his, he would get up to a much higher level than any of us could ever dream of, but he would hit his walls of incompetence. Um, so you, you all will hit yours on a daily basis, but. Focus on the traction of your business. Like when you're fundraising, if you can't show traction, you're not gonna be able to raise capital. Don't waste your time. Like to go back to the sort of the, the, the baby um, at the beginning of this, um, I, have a, I have a three and a half year old daughter. And um, one of the, I think a great way to think about it with your startup is to think about it like it's your child. So um, you can spend, time with the child and help them grow, help them develop, help them learn, help them improve. Or you can go to work and make money so you can pay for their school. And it's the, always that trade-off, right? It's like, I gotta pay for the house and the school and the food and the clothes and all that other stuff, but I wanna hang out with my daughter. And we, that's, that's the, at the end of the day, that's the startup thing. It's like, I can go fundraise or I can work on my startup. And like, you're, when you're fundraising, you're not working on your startup, you're fundraising. And your startup will wither when you're fundraising and when, you're, and when you're not fundraising, your startup will do well, hopefully. Um, and the analogy, I think, is in a lot of ways, fundraising is very binary. You, I've, having seen and having been part of you know, hundreds, or I guess thousands, of, of successful fundraisers now, um, most successful fundraisers, they happen very, relatively quickly and they're relatively easy, or they're like that fundraiser I told you about that took me 100 tries and I failed, uh, or I, I, I almost failed. Um, most of them, the ones that actually succeed, happen relatively quickly. And so whenever you're fundraising and you feel that like it's just not working for you, um, whenever you, you can, and you can basically go and work on basically improving your traction, improving the evaluation of your idea, improving your business, and just kind of getting, moving that ball forward, um, I, I highly recommend, I highly recommend um, that you focus on traction. Because just getting the traction of your business going and getting it moving will, um, uh, will, will take you a long way. Um, that metaphor didn't work very well. But anyway, um, it's, it's important. So this is the, the, one of the best ideas of, uh, of startups that I've learned. And, uh, um, uh, Michael Seibel, who runs Y Combinator, is famous for this. Um, and and his, his analogy is, um, so you're starting a business. Imagine that your customer's hair is literally on fire, burning. Like my hair is burning, like burning. That's your customer. In whatever business you have, this is the way it should be. Your, the customer's hair is burning, and you can hand him a brick, a literal physical brick, and say, hey, give me money for this brick so you can put your hair out. And the customer is desperate to give you the money in order to take the brick, which is the worst tool ever for putting out a flaming hair. Uh, but yet, because their hair is burning, they're so desperate to put it out that they're happy to buy a brick from you because they're, they have so much pain in their problem. Um, Having, you know, in those eight pivots that we did at Trigit, I, I learned how valuable and true that is. Um, 
you really want to search for that. You want to find that process where your product is either 10 times better than anyone else out there, or the need is so bad, the pain is so hard, that you can call up your customer at 9 o'clock at night while they're putting their kid to bed. They answer the phone from a phone number they don't recognize, and then you say, hey, I have X, and they're like, hey, shut up, i got to take this call. You want that. It's super duper important in the process of the company. Like, to, to, to get traction, you need that. And so at Trigit, you know, when we were, when we were going through our first eight pivots, I would call up customers and they would say, hey, Zach, uh, don't call me again. Like, I don't want to buy your product. Like, this product sucks. Like, and, uh, you know, you know we, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to scrap through this. I'm going to fight through this. I'm going to make it happen. Like, you know, we got to a couple million dollars in revenue and it was like, oh my God, I'm really making progress. Then, we, we did a deal with Facebook um, and we were able to power retargeting on Facebook. And suddenly, we'd call up those same customers and, and like we'd schedule an hour for the call and two minutes into the call, they'd be like, hey, Zach, send me the contract. I, need, I want to start tomorrow. I mean, we went from two million to 30 million in revenue in the space of 12 months. I mean, like we were just literally like this. And, and now having watched businesses over and over and over again, I think the secret to Silicon Valley, the secret to this business, the game we play, is that technology scales amazingly well, but the search is to find that rocket that is product market fit, where you basically find a customer whose hair's on fire, you hand them a shitty ass product, which is a brick, and they happily pay you for it. That search is what you're all searching for. It's what you should look for. It's the secret to this business. Um, and as an investor, what we look for, what we want to do, is I want to avoid all the pain that you all go through. Like in the early years of the company where it's going like this and you have eight pivots, I don't want to invest in that shit. I don't want to have any part of that. Like you go do all that hard, brutal, painful work. What we're all looking for is that moment where the business basically starts to rocket ship. Um, and that's where we want to invest because that's where all the money gets made. Um, and so my recommendation to all of you um, in a lot of cases is just keep searching for that product market fit because when you find it, it's the most amazing thing ever. Like, I, it, uh, oh, hold on. I, I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, anyway, it's, 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 it's super awesome. Uh, so keep it lean, keep it tight, search for that product market fit, and um, uh, you'll be in a great spot. Um, so let me talk a little bit about smart money. Um, so Reed was one of our investors. Um, and uh, so we had, uh, when we were about to go out of money, out of business, that April 1st deadline where the notes were due, um, we had this investor, um, and uh, his note, for whatever reason, it came due before everybody else. I don't know how we screwed that up so bad, but somehow his note came due like three months before everyone else's note. Um, so he called his note because we had some money in the bank and he thought we were dead and the, everything was going to shit and you know, uh, it, it was actually, it wasn't him, it was a VC firm that did it. Um, and, uh, and Reed, um, I got to see Reed like twice a year. Like Reed's super busy, I mean he's a billionaire, right? Like, I mean, like, but for whatever reason, Reed was willing to go to lunch with me and we sat down to lunch um, and, and Reed, Reed kind of always has a look like this on his face, which is sort of like, He's just like, you can tell it, like he's just like thinking. And so I just told him this whole story, like just, it all spilled out of me. And I, I swear I was probably sweating and jabbering and like, like telling him like, oh my God, they're gonna put us out of business and like they're demanding we pay him this money and it's like this terrible situation and we're killing it and we found RTB and oh my God, the business is great and I've gone to 100 pitches and everyone said no and like, it was like, I'm sure I was like a, 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 a mess as an entrepreneur trying to, to share this story. And, and Reed sat there to this whole process and looks at me and he's like, okay. Here's what we're going to do. You go tell those guys to fuck themselves. He's like, and you tell them that you're going to shut down the business tomorrow. Done. Turn all the money to all the other investors. There's not much left. I think there was like, there was like 300 left. So it would have gone to $2 million worth of notes. Would have gotten 300K worth of capital. Everyone would have lost money. Reed and his partners win for like half a million or more. So like he would have lost a lot. Um, and you guys go start over. You rewrite everything you have, and I will reinvest in the new company. And we get rid of those fuckers, and we rebuild this thing, and we go back to it. Um, and the great thing about Reed is that one, he was good for his word in that situation, because that's the, what Reed has learned and what I've always aspired to do 
and what I think is probably one of the most important things as an entrepreneur or to recognize from great, with great investors is that the secret to this business as an investor is to somehow be cool enough that you get to invest in Mark Zuckerberg's company or whatever great company is about to take off right when the rocket's taking off. You want to basically have a reputation of being a stand-up cool person. And so Reed basically said, I will always be entrepreneur friendly no matter what because I want to be known as the stand-up guy because I want to be able to get into those few deals that make all the money rather than most you know, evil investors who basically try to fool a bunch of tricks and care about a few dollars. Reed wants to make billions where when most, many investors basically like squabble for a few dollars. So he's always entrepreneur friendly. So he's super smart because one, he's a stand-up guy. And he basically said, like, I'm going to stand up to the entrepreneur here while another investor is trying to screw them. But two, he was also really smart because he knew that basically as soon as they heard that he said that, they would back down because he's got this amazing name. And when Reed says, go fuck yourself, you kind of listen. Um, and so I realized that basically like, um, uh, uh, you know, getting great investors is really hard. But if you can get them, they are amazing. They really can change your business. And so like, Back to what I said about smart money earlier, if you can figure out ways to get them in the loop one way or another, like whether it's professors or great fancy investors who are famous, whoever it is, like it's certainly worth doing. Because on the other side of the equation, um, the dumb money that's out there is brutal. Um, I realized that when you need money, you need money, but it's so bad. And I've watched a lot of companies get ruined by dumb money. Um, it's, it's pretty excruciating. Um, and, and what I mean by that is like, you really want somebody who's an investor who's super comfortable losing it and not caring. Because when they do start to care about the investment that you are, like, it's, it's, it just, you end up spending too much of your time on a, a person and not enough of time on your business. And it's, it's rarely worth it. Um, like I said, uh, when I was in Boston pitching that VC meeting and I had those, those guys calling me up. I mean, they made my life miserable. They made me focus on their problems, which is the fact that they didn't know what they were doing, rather than focusing on my problems, which is how to build this business. Um, it, it's, yeah, just try to avoid people who aren't comfortable losing the money that is the investment in your company, because it will be pretty brutal otherwise. Um, uh, I could tell you so many stories, but I don't really want to, because like, uh, I just make these people look bad. But like, bad, bad investors is, is not good. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up with a couple, um, couple quick ideas, and then I'm excited for any questions you have. Um, one, uh, just go for it. Like, I, I look back at the, the, my entrepreneurial career, and I would do it over and over and over and over and over again. It's so cool. Like, it's the most amazing ride ever. It's the hardest job in the world. It's brutal. It doesn't get better. It gets harder and harder. Um, it's just, you just keep crashing into walls of your incompetence. Um, it's, it's humbling, but you learn more than anyone else, faster than anyone else, because you're in the middle of it. You get to make the decisions. Every decision you make, you get to see what's good and what's not. Like, the, the ride is amazing. Um, go for it. Please, please go for it. Um, I'm, I'm in awe of all of you who do it, and I, I love the fact that um, you guys are doing it, not me right now, because I'm a little worn out, but um, go for it. It's amazing. Um, the, the feeling of having it work is the best feeling you, well, pro one of the best feelings you probably will ever have in your life. Um, and I hope that all of you get a chance to feel that rocket when it starts to take off. Um, the, the, the feeling of just like seeing it go is so good. Um, so, um, yeah, please go for it. And don't, don't be that guy. Um, so, uh, if questions, um, uh, I'm happy to answer any question you have about anything. Uh, so, uh, you can give me like any any question, the dirty secrets of venture capital, whatever you want to know. I'm happy to share it. The harder the questions, the better. I love questions. So, so most investors focus on a particular industry. Yes. I'm curious what wisdom you have to offer uh, in finding investors and advisors in an in, in industry you're creating that doesn't exist already. Um. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I mean, the easy answer to that is I find it hard to believe that there's not analogous industries or things that are close to it that people who have um, vision can see sort of the extension of what you're doing or where it's going. Um, 
That's the easy answer. That may or may not be true in your case. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, the hard answer is you just got to keep searching for them and looking for those people and talking to those people. Um, like I said in the beginning, it's, it's kind of a matching problem. It's kind of like finding the person that you want to get married to. You're going to be stuck with those people and they're going to be stuck with you for a long time. And like that's hard. That's a hard problem. And so like you, yeah, you got to kind of just keep searching and like and hope you can find somebody who's got the same imagination you do. Um, and then the great thing is that as, as you start to get traction, you'll, what you'll find is that it's easier for people to have imagination when they can look at a graph. Like if you look at like a late stage business, like those guys have no imagination. Like the late stage investors, like they, they claim to have imagination. No, they're just really good at spreadsheets. And they just look at all the data and they're like, okay. And they, and they all have like slightly different variables. Um, it's funny, in the VC world, we all joke that whoever is above us has no imagination. Everyone who's below us is stupid. Um, but, uh, but it's true, those guys up there, they're, they have no imagination. Um, I hope that helped. Yes? So, uh, man, this thing gets it. I think they're recording it, so they want to put this on the mic. Sorry. Thanks, that was very helpful, really timely. And um, in the introduction, you were talking about pre-seed and seed. And um, our company had the experience, sort of like your pawn shop, where we you know, focused really small, got great results with like, you know, 88% conversion, and it was just like, you know, we like, it really felt like, wow, we're validating this crazy idea. Awesome. And then, um, so spent a lot of the summer out talking to investors to do seed round, and they were like, great, um, come back when you have more traction. So, which I, you know, people say, hey, you're just getting blown off, and that may be. Yeah. But again, it was sort of like, rather than continuing to build the traction, it did start to stagnate. So, I'm trying to, like, uh, for, I guess, a couple questions. One is understand, then, the difference between pre-seed and seed. And then secondly, um, uh, how to interpret that. Because sometimes it feels like the finish line kind of keeps getting pushed back, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's so frustrating. I'm sorry. I, I, I've been there. I feel your pain. Um, the, it's hard to opine on your particular circumstance without knowing exactly what you do and where you're at. Um, but I think there's two, there's, two, there's two things. I think there's another, there's another lesson here, which is that there's, there's kind of like, there's like three kinds of companies out there that investors like to invest in. There's companies that fit into a framework that they've already seen before that is like very clearly a match. So it's basically like it's a SaaS business that has certain SaaS metrics and certain MRR and certain ARR growth and the CAC LTV ratio has a certain perspective to it. And like they can look at it on a cohort analysis and they can cleanly understand the business relative to every other business that's come along just like them. If you're in that category, then yes, you need to just keep focusing on hitting those metrics because every, every business that's in a well-understood business model with a well-understood approach, if it's e-commerce, if it's like, take your pick, any of these businesses that have been around marketplaces, social networking, any of these businesses have been around for a long time, um, it, you, that's, that is just the nature of the market right now, which is you need to basically hit those metrics to be successful in raising capital, and if you don't, it will be very difficult, or what you'll end up with is less sophisticated investors who don't understand those metrics well enough, and they're just like they invest in you because they have you know, they just don't know what they're doing. But if you're in a category that's well understood, like you got to hit the metrics of the category. Um, and so a lot of a lot of seed stage investors uh, will play in that SaaS category, and they'll be like, look, we need 20k MRR, and we need 20% MR month over month growth rate, or whatever that is, and then they will have those metrics and. That's largely true because those, those categories, if you think about it from a Bayesian statistics perspective, um, in Bayesian statistics, you have sort of the likelihood of the event actually occurring, and then you have the likelihood of all the events that have come before it that they actually occurred at, and by compounding those two, you have a better chance of knowing what will actually happen in the future event that's coming on. In, in venture investing, um, for markets that are well understood by investors, that's the case. So um, it's case one. Uh, case two, where I like to play, um, is in um, uh, where there's no base set. No, there's no, nobody's seen it before. It's new. It's this whole like, you know, computer vision for identifying fraudulent Louis Vuitton handbags. Like, there's no market there. Um, I like the stuff that nobody gets. Um, in those cases, you just need to keep talking to more investors and do a better job of finding people who actually understand your idea. Um, because oftentimes, when they say, oh, you need more traction, what they're really saying is like, I can't get my head around your idea. Like, uh, I can't. 
a lot of investors, myself included, like it's hard for me to tell you that your baby's ugly. And so if I think it's ugly or if I don't like it, I'm not going to tell you it's ugly. I'm just going to tell you like, well, it's a little too early for me, which might be true. Like if you validate it all the way to the point of it's a billion dollar company, then yeah, I'll invest. But like I, it's oftentimes, it's actually like, it's hard to tell an entrepreneur that, that, that you don't like what they're doing because generally they don't take it very well. And so oftentimes we'll come up with like very gentle excuses to get out of having to continue the conversation. Um, I try not to do that as much as possible. I try to be as truthful as possible, but it's still very hard. Um, so in those cases, sometimes you just need to keep searching for the person who really gets your business. Um, and in the last case, um, uh, it's, it's about basically the, the traction of the business um, and sort of maybe something is slightly wrong with the business model or slightly, something slightly wrong about where you're at. Um, hopefully, if you talk to enough entrepreneur investors, they'll give you feedback on that part of sort of what you're doing, and maybe you can adjust it or change it in a way that they get more excited. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I'm happy to talk offline if you want and try to be helpful. Um, yes. Um, I actually wanted to follow on to her question. I just have a really basic question. What the hell is the difference between a pre-seed and a seed? Yeah. Sure. Like, could you just, from your investor perspective, give me exactly yeah. what that means? Um, so the easy answer is I have no fucking idea. <laughs> it's, it's so, uh, the, I think what it is, is that the LPs, the big institutional investors, they give money to guys like me. And so we have to somehow differentiate ourselves Let's, just like you need to differentiate yourself, like as a business, you need to be differentiated. If you're not differentiated, don't even bother. And so we all come up with these like terms so that we're differentiated. So like some group of people decided, hey, let's, we've got these seed investors and they're really successful. So if we are pre-seed, that means we're before them. So therefore we are specialer. So let's get, let's call ourselves pre-seed and go get money. And um, I, you know, I, I think basically the, the, this, this business has three stages. It has the idea, which should be validated, but it's still an idea. Um, there is the, it's working, let's start to like double down on this thing and start putting capital to work and scaling it. And then there's the, it's working and it's scaling and now we're in the growth stage, so we're gonna put real money to work. Like, that's it. I don't understand all the rest of it, it's confusing to me too. So I don't, I didn't answer your question, but. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Go for it. Um, so, and we talked about this over dinner, yeah, so. Today's A was yesterday's B. Today's C was yesterday's A, right? And so sometimes, you know, if, if you're going out and say, I only need a million dollars to sort of prove out my thesis, and that's going to get me 18 months of runway, today, that's like a pre-seed to me because you're raising a million. Now, I'm so confused. <laughs> I'm, I'm confused. I'm a little bit confused, too, but I do sort of see, like, the seeds are, like, getting bigger, right? So yesterday it might have been a million. Today it's two million is a typical seed um, round that I see. And so sometimes when you say pre-seed, it's, I'm, as a founder, I'm sort of raising less than sort of two million, but I think I'm going to raise enough where I can get to my next set of milestones and then go raise, you know, I might not be ready for my A, but then I'll go raise another $2 million round to get ready for my A. And then I think you, you're right, Zach, that um, investors sort of, you know, like you, you have like these micro VCs, and so you know they might say like, okay, well we'll invest, you know, at, we'll write, write check sizes of a hundred thousand to five hundred thousand, right? And that puts them in one category. And then you have seed investors who write checks of like five hundred thousand to two million, and that puts them in another category. And so, so there's there's some of that going on too. You want to see? I put it. I put it a different way. I think the first one you raise, you raise as much as you possibly can raise from people who believe in you and who believe in the validation of your idea. If you're Jeff Bezos, you can raise a billion dollars on day one. If you're nobody, you can raise fifteen thousand dollars, which was my first uh, the capital that I raised. Um, and uh, most of the time now, these days, theoretically, it's like five hundred thousand to two million. I don't know, but it's some amount of money. But you raise as much as you can, and then you hope to make as much progress with that, that you get to some traction and some proof that DAPE basically means that like professional investors are in the position to like look at your spreadsheet, look at your traction, look at your growth, and start backing up the truck and saying, okay, we believe in the idea, we believe in the concept, we believe in where it's going, and we believe in starting to grow it quickly. 
That's sort of the second stage of investment. And then the third stage is the late time. Everything else, I get confused. Next. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she needs the microphone because we're recording it. So if, if otherwise, I, I could, that's going to repeat it. Yeah, you might need to repeat it because Bill's going to tell me that it might not be going into the videos. You might have to repeat everything. Should I repeat it? Please do. Okay. I will repeat the question. Go ahead. Okay. So you mentioned it, that you started your company with your sister. Yes. Uh, what do you think you started a company with family? Yeah. Um, so the plus side is, is you can trust them, which with founders, not trust in terms of that you think they're going to steal from you. I think one of the most important things with co-founders is that like you, um, it's the hardest job in the world and like you need to know that the other person is aligned with you in where you're going and what you're doing. And um, uh, so having, um, uh, having somebody who you've spent a long time with and you know what they're good at and what they're bad at and like you together can, um, uh, can navigate uh, the hard problems and you can trust that they're going to be with you is awesome. So as I would always start a, co a company with my sister because I trust my sister and she's awesome and she's really, really good. She's way better than I am. Um, on the other side, I know my employees sometimes got freaked out because we would scream at each other really loud and they would be like, mommy and daddy are fighting again. Um, and that's a little bit awkward. Uh, so that you definitely get a weird family dynamic in a company, especially once it gets to scale. Um, so there's some downsides there. I know that there are investors who can be uncomfortable by it. Uh, I'm not as uncomfortable by it because I've done it, but you know, there's, there's, it's, it's been done very, very well and it's been done terribly. Uh, spouses, husbands and wives, sisters, brothers, like advantages and disadvantages. Um, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is the success of your company. So if your sister or brother can help your company succeed, do it. And if they can't, then you know, that's not the right person. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. And I'll just repeat your, what did you say? Um, okay, we can do that. What if any of what you just shared actually applies to nonprofits? And uh, yeah, so I, I started a nonprofit. Oh, so she asked, what, what did I just share that applies to nonprofits? I started a nonprofit in 2002. We did the first online voter registration um, system, absentee ballots. We helped about half a million college students vote over the internet. Um, so I have two years of experience in nonprofits. I think everything. Like at the end of the day, like every lesson here, I would apply if I was going to go start another nonprofit to raising capital with a nonprofit. Um, I think, like, let's say you want to basically go and um, you know teach children uh, in a third world country to read. That's great. I believe in that. Prove that you can do it. Show me how you can do it with a certain amount of money, and that like you can make it happen. And I'm going to get a lot more excited about giving you money in order for to support your mission. Um, you know, every, every aspect of the fundraising process, when I think about it, um, you, know, you know, largely applies to nonprofits. I'd have to think more about it, say everything, but generally I think. Yeah, so at a Medigar Network, we do both venture capital investing and we do uh, grants to nonprofits. But one question that we always have is, can they get to self-sustainability even if they're a nonprofit, right? So that they don't have to keep going back to the well every time. And so I think, back to Zach's point, like, sort of showing sort of subtraction that there's sort of a viable business model where you can get to self-sustainability really helps. Next question. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on AngelList and syndicates? Any ah, yeah. advice you can give the room about those? Um, yes. So I run one of the biggest AngelList syndicates. Um, uh, uh, I'll probably invest about eight million this year via AngelList, so I'm very active. Um, uh, the AngelList, I think, is if, as, an, as a, if you want to raise money in AngelList, um, uh, the secret to AngelList is that there's hundreds of companies on AngelList, and so for the investors that basically are looking on AngelList, it's very difficult for them to differentiate all the companies that are on AngelList. Um, um, so this is very self-serving and biased, but I would highly recommend that if you want to raise money on AngelList, you need to raise it with a syndicate lead, somebody who can put their name on your company and, and put their reputation on it, because it elevates you above all the other companies that are on AngelList. It's um, a great place to go. Even still, what you find for AngelList investors is that they get to look at you know, hundreds of companies a week, and the thing that they, the advantage they have is diversification. So instead of investing in one company and putting $10,000 in, they can invest in 10 companies and put $1,000 in each company. But because they look at 100 companies a week, they can't really do deep diligence. And so what they look for is social proof on AngelList. 
And so even like even as a, a syndicate lead who has a billion dollar exit, like theoretically I know what I'm doing, but in actuality, my backers look at my deals and they're like, oh, is Andreessen leading this deal? Great, we're gonna invest in it. And when I bring in a deal that doesn't have Andreessen, NEA, Greylock, some sort of fancy VC firm leading the round, my backers are suddenly very skittish because they love to be able to just like put thousand dollar checks into sure things, which is like where there's a lot of social proof and they know the diligence has been done and they know that there's a great investor involved. Um, and so unfortunately for what that means for AngelList as a, as a, as a fundraising vehicle is that like you kind of don't even need it if you're going to be able to be super successful on AngelList because it's, you know, it's, um, if you've already got Andreessen investing in a round, what the fuck you need AngelList for? Um, but that is kind of how it tends to work. But um, yeah, as an investor, I think it's amazing. Like you get amazing diversification, which in this business with very nonlinear returns, you can spread your money around very broadly. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a great place to invest. Um, but for raising capital, um, it's really about the syndicate lead that you work with, and you want to have that person involved, and and you really need social proof um, in order to be successful raising capital there. Uh, you had a question? Cool. Uh, first of all, thank you. This has been absolutely fabulous. Okay. Um, a, uh, one of the most common questions I get as a founder is that helpful question, really, how long have you been at this? Sure. So given the point about uh, taking the time to make the mistakes and spin around in circles it takes with the friends and family money and so on to get there before you get out there raising money, what's the most effective way to answer that question about how long have you been at this? Um, you know, I would kind of reframe that. I, I think the, the, I think what I'm trying to share today is it doesn't really matter how long you've been at it. It's about, like, have you, have you accomplished traction? Have you accomplished validation? Have you accomplished sales? Have you accomplished growth? Have you accomplished something demonstrable in that period that you've been at it? That then I as an investor can look at where you are and where you've been and where you're going and look at the market that you're growing into and the product and the approach and all the things about investing that you know, we try to, try, to, you know, try to figure out and then you know, somehow convince myself that it's going to be worth billions of dollars. Um, so I don't think it matters how long you've been at it. I think it matters how much you've achieved. Um, so I think if anyone, anyone gets hung up on how long you've been doing it, you're probably talking to the wrong person. You should go talk to somebody else. Um, yeah. Any, yep. I love all the questions, by the way. Um, I would always feel really sad if I gave one of these talks and everyone just walked out. Uh, I'd be like, shit. So yeah, I'm curious um, what you think about the relative importance of the, the founder, the, yeah. sort of the quality of the CEO in, in particular. It seems that a lot of investors and a lot of those in the field will talk about so the importance of team but my observation is a lot of the conversation that, that goes on with with entrepreneur and potential investor tends to be about product tends to be about market and competition etc mm -hmm. I speak to other investors the feedback of why they do or don't invest tends to be more about those latter factors so it, is it you know speaking about those other issues is that sort of a backdoor to assessing an entrepreneur or do, do investors believe it's important yet Maybe they don't have the tools to actually dig in and understand the entrepreneur at a deeper level. Yeah. Um, I'll give you two somewhat contradictory answers to this. Um, one, uh, you can't really talk to an entrepreneur about the team. Like, if I tell you that your co-founder's a moron, like, you're probably not going to take that very well. But it happens all the time. Like, I, or even the founder who's pitching me, I'm like, this guy's dumb. Like, I can't invest in this person. So it's hard to provide genuine feedback or back and forth about the team. And so you don't hear it, but it happens. Like that's, uh, you know, I would say for me, like it's probably the most important part of the equation. Like if there's no good founder there, I can't invest. Like it's, I don't care how good your product is or how good your market is. Like, I mean, we could name, I could name a ton of companies that are like run by idiots that, you know, are doing really well, but I'm pretty sure are going to go into shitter. Like, I, I, just, I just can't get my head around investing in people that I don't think are really good entrepreneurs. Um, but I'm never going to tell an entrepreneur I don't think they're a good entrepreneur. Because the second part of this I think is also true, which is it's very difficult to judge an entrepreneur in the moment. Like, it's just like, it's, it's an intangible thing. It's like trying to judge a person on the first date you just met on Tinder. Like, 
how are you going to know if you're going to marry this person or not? But as, on, as an investor, that's what you're doing. You're meeting somebody and then like they're asking you to marry them on the first Tinder date. Like that's a little crazy. Um, and so like I personally love, I love to figure out a way to get involved with the company and hang around and watch the entrepreneur over time and learn and see how they deal with adversity, see how they deal with success, see how they deal with all the fucking heartache and pain and joy and suffering of running a startup and see how they, how they operate and get a feel for them and their abilities. Um, and then kind of wait a little longer and wait for the business to start to go like this and then, then invest. Uh, which is very self-serving, but it's, that's how you make your money in this business. Um, so I don't know if it's possible to really evaluate a team on the spot. Like, I don't, it, you know, I think there's a lot of people who can say, oh, I can look at the resume. Bullshit. Like, uh, resumes don't tell you anything. Um, it, it's a very, like, the job is so brutal. Like, you need to have, the, the, you need to have a personality that thrives in adversity. You need to have the horsepower to think through hard problems. You need to be, you need to be sp- Dumb enough to basically crash through a brick wall with your skull first, um, which is what the job is every day. But you need to be smart enough to realize that sometimes you should stop, look at the wall, and realize you can walk around it. Like, which are two contradictory things, but it's true. Like, in order to be an entrepreneur, you need to be able to do that. Which is, um, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't look at a person and say this person is that or not. So I like to watch over time. But, um, but yeah, that was sort of contradictory or very contradictory. But both of those are tr- very true, at least for me. So broadly, I'm interested in your thoughts on bootstrapping versus raising a little bit of pre-seed money. And if I were to narrow that a little bit, let's say I can either raise 500K or put in 100K, which I also know that when it came down to it, I'd probably put in 200K. Um, And let's also say that I think there's a good chance I could get some traction with that 100K. It's not a situation where, like, you can't even launch an MVP for 100K or 200K. Um, How how do I think about that decision? Yeah. Uh, Easy answer, super complicated, impossible to answer in one sentence. Uh, hard answer, which I think is more true. Uh, uh, um, if you have a business that has the potential to be a multi-billion dollar business, so it could be huge, monster, ginormous, or just like a really, really big business. I, as an entrepreneur, if I was going to go start another company, I would always, always, always raise as much as I possibly could to give myself the runway because I know I'm stupid and that I will take me a long time to like sort through the problems, I would just go raise as much as I possibly could and bring that war chest to bear and get to work. So I'd sell 25 to 30% of my company. I'd never sell more than that. Raise as much as I possibly can from whoever I can get it from and get to work on the problem because you know, capital, having the ability to spend capital and not having to save every dollar and dime enables you to make smarter decisions for the long term and be more strategic about hiring great people and putting resources to bear. And when it's a big business, it doesn't matter. Like, you, the, it, like this game is very, bi- when it's a big startup and it's a multi-billion dollar company, it's binary. You either get on that rocket ship ride or you don't. And so like, it's that period of like iteration after iteration after iteration and then you take off and you just want to make sure you have enough fuel to sit on the pad until eventually you get that thing to light up. And so like, I would recommend raise as much as you can if that has potential to be a big business. If it doesn't, then you should not raise a lot of money because raising money creates this really, really nasty problem where suddenly you've raised a bunch of money, people need you to exit for a certain amount, but the business is never going to get there. If instead you had gone slower and owned the whole thing, you'd be so happy. My happiest friends who are entrepreneurs, they own the whole business and they just sit there and take dividends off it and they fly around the world and they party all the time and they're super duper happy and they have no board of directors, no investors, and they're like totally set up and I'm so jealous. Like those guys are super lucky. Um, guys and girls, those folks. Um, so if you can do that, if you can bootstrap into a profitable, successful business that will never get big, but that you can own the whole thing, um, uh, you should do that. Um, investors, at the end of the day, are three things. They're a cost, because you've got to spend time to convince them to sign up, and then you have to spend time dealing with them after they've signed up, and then you have to do a bunch of things with your company that are, may not be the right thing because it's what your investors need. They're very problematic. Two, you can never get rid of them, so you're stuck with them for the rest of your life. And when they're like super annoying, you're like, ah, I wish I didn't have this person. I mean, it's like worse than being married. You can divorce a person if you're married. Like, you're stuck with your investor. And three, what ends up happening is that once you start raising money, you, you, raise, you basically start spending money faster than you have it, almost from the beginning. And then you, usually what happens is that you raise more money, and then you kind of just keep piling up your costs. And before you know it, you're like that character from, you know, um, uh, 
was a, I don't know, um, blanked on it. Anyway, you're just covered in chains and you're bleeding everywhere because the chains are rubbing you raw and you hate them and they hate you and it's terrible and miserable and it's horrible. So unless you've got a billion dollar opportunity, don't do it. But if you have a billion dollar opportunity, pile it up and go. Um, that helped. Uh, any more? Two more questions? Okay. At the poker game, Ha was always the boss. Uh, it was funny. There'd be like nine guys sitting around the table, and Ha, and like I think it's coming from being a mom, but she like she kept them in line. So it's, it's good to see you still here. Go for it. I really appreciate the advice you're giving. Oh, it's cool. really good. Um, but I'm interested, since there's a lot of international startups here, you as an investor, how do you look at the part of incorporation? Like for me, I'm incorporated in Denmark and have been told by most investors that I need to move everything here. And what is kind of your advice on that? If you have a product, you have maybe something that fits in Scandinavia or other parts of Europe right now. Yep. And then getting, yeah, kind of in bed with an American investor. Like, how to handle that? What, how, what is your position on it? Yeah. I would say, actually, the advice I just gave about bootstrapping is relatively analogous here. Um, I think that you shouldn't, like, if you work with American investors, it's an even bigger cost if you're based in Denmark. Like, you have to fly to them, they have to fly to you. They can provide value, but it's going to be like, you should only do that if you think the business has the potential to get really, really, really big. At which point, then you should do everything it takes to figure out how to raise as much money as possible uh, and scale up the business as fast as possible if you think it's a big, 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 big opportunity. Um, if you don't think it's that big, then, you know, oftentimes it, those costs slow you down a lot. Like, when you reincorporate, when you have to deal with a different set of lawyers and a different set of problems, especially if you're based in another country, it's painful, slow, and it's going to cause you to not move as fast as you probably could and if you basically stayed focused on your knitting. Um, that's not true. I, I don't think, I mean, so it's both true and not true. Um, contradictory, I know. Um, it's, it's not true if you have an amazing company that is like a clear winner and everybody wants to give you money. Um, but if you, if you basically are like, if you're a relatively, uh, if you're relatively in the middle of the pack of, of being, able to, being able to raise from professional Silicon Valley investors, um, you know, they often would prefer that because they don't want to have to learn the laws in your country when shit goes wrong or when like you try to screw them or some bad thing happens. I mean, it's easier for them. At the end of the day, I think what the secret to raising capital from overseas, like you have a higher bar than someone who's based here. Because at the end of the day, as an investor, I get to go work in the office of my startups that are based in Silicon Valley, but my company that's in Berlin, like I get to see them once a quarter. And so I need them to be that much more awesome for me to accept that inability to be as helpful and to be as involved and to keep an eye on them compared to what I have in Silicon Valley. So you have a really high bar that you have to jump over as an international company to raise capital from Silicon Valley investors. Um, so by asking you to incorporate here, they're trying to lower that bar a little bit to make it easier for, for them to deal with you. Um, but it's still a high bar. It's hard. But on the other hand, you know, um, there's advantages and disadvantages to it. But if you think you have a massively big idea, I mean, it would be super powerful. OK, last question. Oh, this guy, because he charged my phone. <laughs> He's my hero for the night. <laughs> Woohoo! Killing it. I'm good. Now, this is quite different from what anybody else has asked you. How do you um, evaluate the industry that you're in, that you're in? For example, I I have a mobile app that we reckon we can teach a billion people to learn to read English for three dollars a year. Well, nobody cares. Education's been a graveyard because so many things have gone wrong with ed tech. Uh, and so, you know, I'm tempted to just wait a couple of years and because it's a golden age for education around, around the corner, but it's not here at the moment, I don't think. Yeah. Um, I, I think my first response to that was like, wow, like if you can teach someone to read for three bucks a year, that's pretty awesome. Um, I, I actually think it's to your advantage as an entrepreneur when the market is cold. Because what that means is that you can go slower and more carefully and 
get traction and prove it out. And then when the market gets hot, you're there and you've built something and you, you've established it. So, you know, you, you figure out for three bucks a year, like you can go run, you can go buy ads on Google in a whole bunch of third world countries and you can sell it for three bucks a year and like you can get a bunch of users on it and you can prove that it works. And suddenly when the market comes around, you're in a much advantaged position to somebody who starts fresh. In fact, I think this is generally a lesson about raising capital is when the market's really hot, it's actually bad for you as the entrepreneur because what happens is that yes, you get a bunch of capital, which is great, but so do all of your competitors. And your competitors basically then drive you to do irrational things and to move faster than you're comfortable and to plow into those walls of your own incompetence harder and faster because the capital fuels your flight. And it fucks up businesses over and over and over again. So when you're lucky to be in a market that's a little cold and you can go a little slower, like, I don't think it's not really, I mean, it's harder as an entrepreneur. You got to work harder. You don't get paid as much and you don't have as many resources, but you kind of get to go slower and develop it more carefully. Um, so I don't think it's always bad. Um, but I think the ed tech market is huge. And anyone who says this, it's like, yeah, we, I mean, every major market has lost lots of money. That's fine. Like, yeah. hope that helped.